I'm Lowell Turner, director of the Worker Institute at Cornell, hosting this webcast from the ILR School at Cornell University here in Ithaca, New York. The Worker Institute promotes research, education, and public dialogue aimed to advance worker rights and collective representation. We believe these are key elements of a sustainable society, and we're especially pleased to host this event today addressing a burning issue facing our workforce, economy, and society. Joining us today from Washington, D.C., are Eliseo Medina, International Secretary of Treasurer of the SEIU, a union with over two million members, and Randy Johnson, Senior Vice President of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, along with Maria Figueroa of the Worker Institute at Cornell, who will moderate the event on site in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Randy and Eliseo. We know you are immersed in negotiations and advocacy there in Washington, D.C. in Congress concerning this landmark immigration reform debate. And we are very pleased and thankful that you could take time today to join us for this discussion. Um, and now, to outline the issues at stake, here is Professor Kate Griffith of the ILR School at Cornell, who is also an associate of the Worker Institute. Today is the Border Security, Economic Opportunity, and Immigration Modernization Act of 2013. I'm just going to give you a summary here because it is approximately 870 pages in length. Uh, but the underlying rationale of the bill is to address unauthorized immigration by amping up both interior and border immigration enforcement, and at the same time by enhancing legal routes for immigration through changes to our visa programs and the establishment of a path to legalization for the approximately 11 million unauthorized immigrants currently in the United States. In terms of interior enforcement, one of the main goals is to make it harder for unauthorized immigrants to gain employment when they're in the United States. So the, the bill proposes to mandate that all employers use an electronic verification system to check the employment eligibility of their employees. Currently, federal law gives most employers the option to either use the I-9 paper-based process or the electronic verification system called E-Verify. By making it mandatory, it would be a major change because most employer, to use the electronic system because most employers use the paper-based system. In terms of border enforcement, there are a number of changes there, adding Border Patrol agents, adding fencing along the U.S.-Mexico border to make it more difficult in the future for immigrants to come in without authorization. In terms of the path to legalization, it's a multi-step process whereby first an individual will get a provisional status, then legal permanent resident status, and then eventually citizenship status. And in each of those stages, of course, there are certain conditions that need to be met. So for the first stage, for the provisional stage, there'll be criminal background checks. The person will need to pay fines. They'll need to pay any back taxes if they're owed and that kind of thing. At the legal permanent resident stage, the status won't even be granted unless certain immigration enforcement thresholds have already been met. There are some, uh, the process is a little bit different for individuals who came as children, the so-called dreamers, and for agricultural workers, but the sort of detail, I won't get into that, that here, but it's good to know that, that there's some differences there for those groups. And then finally, the bill proposes a lot of changes to the visa programs, the employment-based programs, the family-based programs, the high skill, the low skill. Uh, but an important one to highlight here is the proposed establishment of a new visa category, the W visa, for lower skill workers, so basically no skill requirements. And the bill proposes to eventually have uh, a cap on these of 200,000 uh, people a year who could, who could have these visas, and the establishment of a Bureau of Immigration and Labor Market Research, which will help decide year to year what kind of labor market needs there are uh, in various industries. So the last major immigration overhaul like this was in 1986, the Immigration Reform and Control Act. And that act was, was, had very similar elements, a major legalization program, tightening of the borders, and trying to address immigration through the workplace, through employment-based 
uh, kinds of uh, restrictions like the verification system, but also sanctions on employers. But we haven't seen anything of this magnitude since 1986. And even then, it took Congress 15 years to pass that bill. So what's interesting here, and, and the W visas is part of this, is that there is some agreement between business and labor on some of these main elements already. So, so that's only a good thing in terms of, of compromise. But it's difficult to balance, as you're saying, interests of various groups at the same time. And I think we'll only get this legislation passed if we can find a bill that works for employers and works for workers, too. from Kate Griffith. With the key issues now out on the table, let's go back to Washington, D.C., to Maria Figueroa, Eliseo Medina, and Randy Johnson. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, and also thank you, Eliseo and Randy, for being here uh, to have this discussion with us. Um, as the video that we have just uh, seen or that was shown on the webcast indicated, um, the agreement that labor and business achieved was the driving factor or if not the, a decisive factor for introducing the bill. So um, uh, that indicates or suggests that the agreement that was reached is reflected in, in this bill uh, as it currently is. So, uh, uh, and suggests that it would be beneficial to both uh, labor and employers. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Can you explain in what ways would this bill in its current form uh, benefit workers and employers? Well, uh, first of all, Maria, thank you very much for inviting me to participate. Thank you, Lowell. I also want to thank you, the Cornell Institute for Labor Relations, for hosting this webcast today. Well, you're absolutely right. You know, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and Labor have reached an agreement on the future flow of immigrants coming to this country. Uh, and it's, I think it's very interesting because uh, with all due respect to my good friend Randy, there's not a whole lot of issues that we agree on. But on this one, we absolutely agree. The current immigration system is broken, and we need to fix it. And what we need to do is we have to have an alternative to people not being able to come to this country except walking through the desert, putting their lives at risk. So the agreement that we made basically says that there will be, uh, for the first time, an opportunity for uh, uh, employees to come to this country, not on a temporary basis, but uh, on a, a, a year-round basis that they will have rights uh, that can be enforced, uh, that they will be able to do those rights to uh, deal with abusive employers, and if they're being mistreated, that they can leave the job just like any of us here in the United States can do and go find another job with another employer who is part of this program. And I think that this is very important uh, because uh, we can't have people coming here on uh, status without any rights. You know, we already saw what happened in Hershey, Pennsylvania, where we had uh, uh, students coming in on a J visa who got thought they were coming on a uh, uh, cultural exchange and actually wound up working for minimum wage. So this agreement, I think, will finally be able to begin to deal in a, in a real way with a lot of these problems. Right. That's, that's great. Um, Randy, you'd like to add to that? Well, first of all, I'm not going to necessarily agree with what happened exactly in the Hershey case. There's much disagreement with the facts were. So, um, and, uh, but beyond that, first of all, I think the agreement that we reached with regard to the so-called WVs of lesser skill uh, was precedent-setting precedent in the sense that really, as I was saying, I think hinted at, there's no program at all right now in, in that so-called lesser skilled area. There's the H2B program, which is capped at 66,000. That's limited to seasonal. And there's the you know, so-called H1B program, which I'm sure your, your watchers are familiar with, the, the more higher skilled. And then AG, of course. But there's really nothing in this other area, which is a vast swath of our economy. And as I know, LSA would agree, it's by having a program in that area that's workable and it does protect worker rights and, and it's workable for employers, it's a legal way to fill jobs here uh, and therefore taking pressure off the border to fill available jobs from an illegal manner. Um, and so that was, I think, the well-acknowledged failure of the 86 Act, which was there was no sort of temporary worker program. Therefore, that led to continued uh, illegal immigration. 
Uh, so, so it's both from the employer standpoint. It, it's it's both a way to to fill jobs we need when we recruit from the domestic workforce and there's not U.S. workers available. Uh, but it's also a border security issue because it, it, it provides a, a legal way for these workers to come into the country. They will be screened, you know, like any work, like any visa holder coming into the country, family or not, uh, and therefore uh, takes pressure off the border. Uh, which would promote illegal immigration to fill jobs, so-called job magnet. Uh, but I think more, more of the key is, is we had six months because they're unpleasant, <laughs> um, but we reached an it agreement. That bad. Come on. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I think in the background, always for all of us was we needed to get through this to get to the other parts of the bill, which are also important, of course, to the unions and the employer community, which is legalization, uh, certainly the ag program, the high scale program, border security. But LSA and I both went through the, uh, um, the, um, the last debates, and one, one of the issues that brought down the, the 2006 bill, or was it 2000, 2007 bill, I guess, was when the AFL-CIO came in and opposed the lesser scale program. And, uh, and then there were certain amendments on the floor which decimated the program. Therefore, much of the support from the employer community dissipated. And so this was part of trying to head that off and to deal with it up front. So it's a good program in and of itself. It's more, more limited than we would like, but it, uh, it certainly has wage protections in there for, for U.S. workers and for immigrant workers. But it was a linchpin to get to the rest of it, I think, as you pointed out. So we always knew we weren't just seeing this in isolation. It was important to do this to get to the rest of the bill. And I can tell you, there was a time on a Friday night when the G4 Republicans called, and that, that would have been the end of it. And then uh, and three days later, people kind of got back together and we were able to move forward. Uh, but that had that Friday night gone a different way, I don't think we'd be sitting here today talking about a bill at all. Right. Well, that's very helpful. Um, uh, so far, we've heard about all the positives um, of the bill uh, for workers and employers. Um, uh, would you like to tell us a bit about any limitations that you see in the current bill and that could possibly still be addressed um, during the legislative uh, time frame? Well, let me just tell you from my perspective, uh, this is not a perfect bill. Mm -hmm. It's a, a, a product of compromise between Democrats and Republicans, and as uh, Randy said, labor and business, and many other of the interests uh, in trying to fix this broken immigration system. So there are some problems, uh, the issues that I don't like. I think 13 years for people to be able to become citizens is way too long. You know, for some people uh, that have been here uh, 20 years and are in the 50s and, and 60s and have been working the rest of their life, it basically means they may never be able to achieve citizenship. But that is what was agreed to. That's uh, what, what is being uh, done. I think the question of cost, you know, even though uh, the fines are not as onerous as I was afraid they would be, the fact is that if you got minimum wage workers, it would still pay a fine paying costs for uh, applying for, uh, uh, for, the permanent, uh, for the temporary provisional status, uh, being able to pay a fine and uh, uh, the cost for applying for legal permanent residence, <coughs> being able to pay a fine in order to apply then for citizenship, could run into the thousands and thousands of dollars. And we've always said that uh, if we're going to get people a uh, path to citizenship, we should not make it prohibitively expensive that will force some people to not ever be able to take advantage of that. Obviously, I think that uh, right now the uh, whole border situation that is so much debated, you know, we're spending $18 billion a year, and only 60% of the undocumented flow comes through the border. And we're spending, uh, we have about 20,000 uh, uh, agents on the border. More the cost and more people than most of the uh, other federal law enforcement uh, combined. And what are they focused on? They're focused on arresting farm workers and nannies and factory workers, people who just want to come to this country to be able to make a living. And I happen to think that it's the wrong focus, that we ought to, first of all, with the resources we have, is be able to focus it on criminals, on drug runners, on gangs, on people who would do us 
arm, and that is more than enough resources to be able to do that. Obviously, having an immigration bill that's comprehensive, as Randy has said, will take pressure on the border because it will channel people away from coming through the, uh, the border. Secondly, by legalizing the 11 million people here, then they won't have to say, all this money that they are doing right now and going out and doing I-9 audits and going in and, and trying to uh, figure out how they can uh, go after employers who have hired undocumented workers. Because quite honestly, a lot of employers are doing that because that's the only option they have. So I think those are the things that I think I, I see a particular problem. Now the issue is that we may be too far down the road to change any of those. We may be able to tinker around the edges, but I think uh, the negotiation going so far down the road is going to be difficult to make any major changes. Hmm. And from your perspective, Randy, uh, what would be uh, the limitations for employers? Well, uh, as I said, I hinted at there's been a lot of compromises made in this bill, and uh, I think from our perspective, uh, some of those compromises might be revisited in the House. I don't know. Um, in fact, I don't want to go into those right now. Uh, and I would say there's a, a smorgasbord of kind of what I would call technical but important issues we're trying to resolve through some amendments on the floor, some deal with E-Verify program, uh, such good faith defenses. Uh, but there, but I, would, I, would, I would categorize those as, as important but technical and often those are the issues that are kind of resolved, uh, and I spent 10 years on the Hill prior to this job, you know, in conference, actually. Because that's sometimes where the staff really drills down and says, holy crap, this bill's going to become law, we've got to get this right. Uh, and those kind of technical issues get lost in the broader debates. I, I think the, the, you know, the chamber, I should emphasize, as I was saying, knows we've been involved in this for over a decade. And our four pillars have always been the same, which is border security, legalization, expanded temporary worker programs, uh, and a mandatory E-Verify system. And those are the four pillars of this bill, and they're going to remain in there. So I think that uh, when I... When, there are... there are if we, had, uh, if we had been writing the whole bill ourselves, it would be different in certain parts, mm -hmm. but it would have those four pillars, and that's what this bill has. So again, I think we're working on some changes at a technical level, and we'll continue to work through those, but overall, I mean, we're... We're happy with the bill. Yeah. And if I may, uh, can I just sort of add to what Randy said on the E-Verify? Yeah. You know, currently the error rates uh, for people, for names who are submitted for verification is really high. And particularly uh, for a lot of us, you know, there's a lot of Jose Lopez's right. and, and, and Juan Rodriguez's. Yeah. And they can't make a differentiation. But if you send it in and there's that kind of error, mm -hmm. then those people are said they're not illegally entitled to work and then they got to be either terminated or they got to go through a laborious process in order to clear that up. So I'm, I, we're particularly concerned. This Randy would be concerned from the problems that it causes for employers. We're concerned from the problems that it could cause to workers. Even though this verified system is part of this, I think that we're going to have to spend a lot of time, both with the technical details, but also in the future to make sure they get it right. Because if they don't, there could be uh, continued disruption of the workforce, uh, and that doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help business, it doesn't help the immigrants, it certainly doesn't help our communities. Right. Yeah, I mean, I do want to say that the Chamber in the past actually opposed mandatory E-Verified, but we, we have changed our position. I testified a couple of weeks ago in front of the House Judiciary Committee, and we do support it now because I think I'll say the error rates have gotten less. Yeah. Obviously, if, if one one individual who is authorized to work is improperly denied a job, that's a small pinprick on the overall statistics, but it's very important to that one person because that, that's, that's a job. It's exactly. not like being denied a you know a minor thing at, at, at the buffet. Uh, right. It's a lifeblood of, of existence. So, yeah, we have to be concerned about error rates and any... The perfect can't be the enemy of the good, and any new system, any new government system, and we're going to be adding a lot of people into this, is, is there's, there's going to be some, some startup problems, and uh, we'll have to, when I say we, all of us, uh, will we'll have to watch DHS carefully, and uh, I, I've testified with them, but I think their heart's in the right place, they want to make this system work. But there will be glitches, there's no question about it. But what government program of this size, or any size, doesn't have some glitches to it?
Yeah, yeah, well, um, yeah, that's, that's usually the focus of the criticism, the e file system on both sides, um, but uh, that's very helpful. Uh, are, are there any other issues that, uh, that you see that could become uh, a problem in terms of the bill? Uh, I know I'm, I'm sure there are many, but uh, just to give you an example, uh, Critics of the bill often refer to the um, the W visa as a possible uh, shortcoming in terms of uh, being a factor for depressing wages. Do we, do you see it that way? Um, it's the first time we have a visa of this type, and so uh, for many it was progress, and for others is it may be a challenge for labor. Uh, in particular, so um, well, I, I get you know. First of all, mm -hmm. if anything, I get I've got a lot of criticism for the program being too limited. Um, so as far as the wage, after much negotiations on the issue, the the test in the in, in the provision is the same as under other under other temporary worker programs, which is it's this you must pay the same level of wages to the American worker in the same job or the so-called prevailing wage, which is sometimes slightly higher than on BLS statistics, for the wage category. And sometimes that results in the immigrant worker uh, getting a slightly higher salary than, than the U.S. worker just because of BLS data. But the purpose of that is to really remove an incentive, I think correctly, from an American employer to use these programs to bring in so-called cheap foreign labor. That's not what happened to these jobs. Uh, it doesn't mean there isn't a bad apple sometimes, somewhere, some not, but there are some of those in the union movement. Uh, and uh, so I think, and this is one of the reasons we were able to, able to reach an agreement with the union, is there's ample protection in there for to prevent the kind of wage abuse that uh, you're suggesting could occur. Uh, and that's why we, we reached an agreement. We're able to, one of the reasons. Well, then let me just say, from my point of view, what depresses wages is the fact that we have 11 million people here without legal status. So you compare it to, let's say, a couple of hundred thousand that are going to come in under the W visa. There's no comparison in terms of the impact in the market. And when we have all these 11 million people, they have no rights. They, they complain, you know, uh, Border Patrol, the ICE agents could show up the next day. They get fired. There's nowhere they can go. That's what depresses wages, the current system. And I think what, if anything... Uh, the W visa has so many more protections that the undocumented do not have. And what we're trying to do with this bill is let's legalize this 11 million people, level the playing field so that we don't have scumbag employers using them to depress wages and working conditions. Because I am convinced that the overwhelming majority of the employers want to do the right thing. They just want to grow their business. They want to be able to uh, do the best job they can but there are some people who will hire people and will exploit them in order to gain a competitive disadvantage. And I think that this will not only create the level playing field, but it will also ensure that we deal with the wage depression of the current system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on that I should know that, that the Chambers also have those has long been a long supporter of the legalization provisions. And sometimes I will get a question like, well, how can we support that, uh, you know, if they stay in the shadows, then, then, you know, they can be subject to sub-minimum wages and stuff. Well, that's not our position. It never has been. And, uh, and we think our members who have some number of the, of the undocumented, obviously, in their workforce, unknown because of the I-9 system, uh, they want to stabilize the workforce. They don't want to be open to ice raids where, where, where whether, whether the employer, even the, whether the employers hired everyone on good faith, they obviously are still subject to deportation and then, therefore, this stabilization of the workforce. Let's get it settled, let's, let's get in legal status, and, uh, and they will, of course, uh, be eligible for all the same labor protections as, as American workers are. Uh, so let's, let's get it done, let's, just, let's get it behind us. Uh, and those few bad apples that LSA was talking about, uh, none of them belong to the U.S. Chamber, uh, you know, will, will not be in that kind of a position. There will always be some black market somewhere, it doesn't matter what economy you're in. Uh, you know, life is not perfect, but this yeah. will certainly go a long ways to, to correct that. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, what your remarks are a perfect segue to the question that I think is in everybody's mind. Uh, you said we have to get it done. So uh, what would it take to get it done? 
Um, what is the, the likelihood that this uh, bill will pass and what needs to happen in order for it to pass? Well, let me uh, just tell you from my perspective, uh, first of all, the first thing that needed to happen for it to pass, it needed to be a bipartisan bill. There are not enough Democratic votes in either house to be able to pass a bill, and I think we've accomplished that in the Senate. Uh, I think that uh, the senators have been negotiating, and I'm told that they may have uh, an agreement on how to do the border that uh, would uh, create uh, a large majority for passage of immigration reform in the Senate next week. If that's true, I think uh, we're going to be in good shape. But then the next and perhaps most difficult barrier is going to be the House of Representatives. Because I think they have a much stronger anti-immigrant, ideological, xenophobic uh, uh, caucus than there is in the Senate. I think we're in for a big fight. I think that it's going to take every ounce of our coalition. It's going to take business. It's going to take labor. It's going to take community groups. It's going to take church groups. It's going to take people of good faith to really push on the house and say, this is a problem we can fix. This is a problem that will benefit all of us. Even the, the, uh, the CBO, when they came out, said legalizing will lower the deficit and create more jobs. Uh, and I'm not an economist, but so I'm, I'm just saying that there is a growing consensus, and we should not lose this opportunity, and we're going to have to fight like crazy to overcome opposition in the House. God willing, we can do it. A lot of work for insurance, and we could have it done in 2013. Yeah, I think my perspective, perhaps because I spent 10 years in the House prior to this job, is a little different, which is that, uh, you know, there are two co-equal branches of government. There's the Senate and the House, and, uh, and, and the talk of sort of the House just accepting the Senate bill uh, was never going to happen. Uh, it almost wouldn't matter what that Senate bill said. There's institutional prerogatives here, and people have, that's what it's about. And to look back, I worked on the Americans with Disabilities Act as one of my first things when I came to, came to the Congress as a counsel of the House Labor Committee. And that passed overwhelmingly in the Senate. Um, and I had some people in the, in the House say, oh, let's just take up the Senate bill. And this just, just wasn't. So we spent a year, and I'm not saying we're going to do that, the House will do that this time. But the House looked at it, made improvements, and then got the President. So, um, and that passed at least by 75 votes. So the House is going to do their thing. I, I can't agree with LSA's characterizations of, of people in the House. Um, they're they're gonna they've got their prerogatives and they've got their own views and the system will have to work work itself through and that's what our founding fathers to say to state the obvious vision. Then it's gonna go to conference and it's gonna come out. Uh, it's a weird thing that when you talk to people on the hill, you can almost find no one who can remember how does a conference work because it's been so long uh, and it's complicated. Well, there really are very few rules in conference, but all the machinations that go on behind it are quite complicated. Um, so, and there's three committees of jurisdiction, of course, in the House, which makes things more complicated. Um, and so we'll, we'll have to, but in the end, no one wants a bad bill. So, you know, it's going to move in the Senate to the House. We're optimistic it's going to move in the Senate to the House, uh, and uh, with, a, with a good vote. And then we'll have to make our case in the House. Yeah, and I, I do think this process uh, is, a, is a process of politics and policy. Yeah. And uh, I'm glad... People like Randy and others are going to work the policy side. My job is to work the politics, and I don't mean the lobbying. I mean we need to make sure that uh, we, the community, the citizens of this country, that let our, make our views known, because that is also part of the process. You know, this is supposed to be, uh, and is, a country, the democratic, where the people are supposed to be able to uh, uh, ensure that they're represented to the I think what well, we're going to make sure that they hear from uh, the representative in order to uh, get this done. Yes. Very good. So um, I think this is a good time, a good time to go to Ithaca and ask whether there are any questions um, from the audience. Is it snowing up there? That's what I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> This has to do with the politics of getting this bill uh, passed. The, you know, sometimes thing, things are famous for dying in, in Washington, even if you have brilliant lobbyists like Eliseo and Randy uh, promoting them. So the question is, do you have a strategy? Do you have strategies for mobilizing support 
outside of Washington? Do you have a, so do you have a strategy for mobilizing uh, unions and immigrant advocacy groups uh, on the labor side? Do you have a strategy for mobilizing employers uh, on the employer side to put, uh, you know, to, to put uh, mass popular pressure um, uh, in favor of passing this bill and getting it passed, all the hurdles that it faces ahead, not just in the Senate, but in the House and then in, in conference? No, no, shit. Uh, of course. No, don't tell me that. <laughs> no, we've, uh, well, first of all, from the Chamber standpoint, uh, we've got regional offices across the country that we have our target list. I'm not going to share who the targets are, but it's about 20 Republicans, and uh, they've been working those states and getting letters into those offices, holding town hall meetings, uh, and uh you know, you, you might be interested, actually, on it because it's not public. You can go to uschamberofcommerce.com, immigration, and see it. But a, but a massive letter just went up to the Hill today signed by uh, high-tech companies from across the country, their CEOs. Uh, we will be sending a letter up signed by companies across the country in the next three or four days. Uh, and uh, there will be other stuff in the wings uh, coming up soon in terms of uh, air war, air, air, uh, air cover and, and ads on TV, etc. And uh, so, look, this is, in a sense, it's Lobby 101, which is we know the targets are in states. And I had my board of directors uh, just yesterday in town. We did a presentation on immigration. Actually, Schumer and McCain came down, and they made clear that some help was needed on grassroots. And, and so, you know, I've gone out to certain boards of director members to ask them to contact the senators in key states. and. It's just, you know, you, you look at the votes, you chip them off one by one, uh, and, and that's just how it works. And, you know, and I, I just I want to add, we've got, unlike almost any other issue, uh, there's lots of people involved in this. We're actually coordinating every one, Wednesday. We meet with our non we, we coordinate con uh, who the targets are, what are we hearing, and that ranges from the unions to the evangelicals, the National Immigration Forum. Uh, La Raza, so it's an odd sharing of information with people, non-traditional allies, and, and, and then we go back out to the targets and work it. And that's what I was going to say. I think Randy is absolutely right. This is perhaps, in my experience, the broadest societal coalition that has ever come together on any one issue. I mean, if you would say labor and, and the chamber being together, you know, we just sent a letter from SEIU and the National Association of Manufacturers to uh, the Senate supporting immigration reform. Uh, as Randy said, we have a Southern Baptist Convention, we got evangelicals, we got community groups, we got Latinos, we got African Americans, APIs. It really is a very broad coalition. Uh, and so we are doing this campaign both by uh, one-on-ones with relationships uh, that Randy has, for example, with the Republicans, Labor has with Democrats, uh, you know, the uh, Evangelicals and, and, and the Baptist Convention also work both sides of, of the aisle, so they are hearing from pretty much a very, very cross-section of society about the importance of this, but we're also taken to the air, you know, uh, SEIU. And, and, and many of our allies have been running ads on television and on radio, letting people know what's going on, making sure they understand why this matters to this country, and in, uh, urging them to take action, because I think that's what it's going to take. It's going to take uh, both a, a big push from outside, a big push from inside Washington, and we do this right. You know, we ought to be done. Nothing's ever guaranteed, that's why we're not letting up. So going back to Ithaca, would you like to follow up on that question? Um, you have another question. Also, I'd like to remind the viewers that they can text their questions to the number provided on, on the webcast link. So here's another question. Um, the, earlier this week, a report came out from the Congressional Budget Office uh, predicting that if this legislation passes, it will actually reduce the deficit over the next 10 years, and even more so over the 10 years after that. And uh, what, what I'm wondering is, if, was this a consideration uh, in your discussions and your negotiations? Did you anticipate this? And uh, is this true? Is this just, and how is, this, how is it that this is going to cut the deficit? 
Well, Randy has been reading all of this, uh, so he should probably lead on it. He'll give you my opinion. Well, and, and the report, of course, is 60 pages long, and, and I would not pretend to be able to understand the CBO's calculations all the time. But I'll, I, in a nutshell, uh, they did come out, and I did look at their charts, uh, reduced the deficit by $197 billion over 10 years. But it was interesting. This is one of those rare times where they actually – took dynamic scoring into effect and, and projected out further than, than 10 years. And they said in the next decade, so in other words, 20 years out, it would reduce the deficit by $700 billion. Uh, You know, what's, what was that based on? Such it's based on the fact that there's going to be more, um, more uh, workers and consumers in this country due to increased immigration, and they're going to be paying more taxes and spending more money. Uh, now, of course, CBO, I want to say, they did look at, of course, when you have more individuals coming into the country, there's other costs. There's going to be costs in implementing this bill. And there's going to be some impact on our on our so-called safety net programs, uh, um, particularly as you go further out and more and more people become eligible. As I'll say on those, there's a, there's a window of ineligibility for a lot of people who are going to become legalized under this window of ineligibility, legalized under this program. Uh, but so the CBO looked at all that and, and came up with the figures. But basically, it's it's based on uh, more workers will have more jobs, and therefore more more taxes will be paid to the government. And there's some other formulations in here dealing with uh, all that increase immigration will lead to uh, greater GDP and and and, and faster faster uh, growth of the economy. But I couldn't quite nail down the figures before I, I came up here. So um, so the economy is going to expand. Uh, in some part due to the passage of this legislation, and that's what the CBO looked at. So not being an economist or having read it as thoroughly as Randy, I would just uh, tell you from my experience, if we have 11 million people who, won't, who will be able to now uh, say to their employers that they want to be paid uh, according to minimum wage at uh, least, then they won't be able to go out and be, uh, be able to get better jobs. Uh, some of them, the more money they make, the more they can spend. You know, if they uh, wind up making uh, at least minimum wage in some cases where people are not right now, they will go and buy food, they will buy clothes, they will be able to get perhaps a little better apartment. At some point, they may even be able to buy a house. All of that creates economic activity, which I think is good. Secondly, I think that the fact that we now will have all of those dreamer kids be able to finish their education and then be able to graduate and then go out and, and uh, practice in the chosen fields, whether it be in the law, medicine, or whatever. You know, we are creating, in fact, the next generation of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, entrepreneurs and providers and, and taxpayers of the future. So I, uh, the experience in this country is that when people have opportunity, it leads to benefit for everybody, and I think this will be the case again. And without having any experience with the numbers, just from first-hand experience, I think that's what it will lead to. Yeah, my only caveat, my surprise would be, I don't, I, I don't believe there's many people, even who are unlegalized, who are not legalized, who are, who are being paid less than minimum wage. So, but uh, I think the broader point is, people become legalized, and as Senator McCain yesterday said uh, to our board of directors. People then, you, you grab the first rung of the ladder, and then you get better, you move up, and you move up, and that's the American way. And, uh, and that will lead to, to uh, better jobs and, and better wages and, frankly, more taxes to the government, uh, which should make the Obama supporters who are listening happy. Uh, but uh, so that's kind of what CBO looked at, and I should mention that, that we really, there's a lot of green cards in there for the higher skilled immigrants. Uh, obviously, the increase on the H-1B program, and I think most people can see that people with PhDs and masters in the STEM fields, etc., in, in their own way, are going to lead to better job growth in this country and and uh, better ability of our employers to compete, etc. So it's good for the country. Uh, as a follow-up to that, do you see any specific sectors that are more likely to benefit from uh, legalization and the entire uh, and all the provisions in the bill? Uh, for, um, maybe healthcare in the sense that you know we experience the shortage of uh, personnel in certain um, occupations. Well, that's a good point. Healthcare is a good one since uh, you know, God willing, we're all going to live longer and wind up uh, needing help. Maybe yeah, needing help, uh, and uh, and certainly. Uh, 
nursing homes, uh, have elder care. The elder care industry has, has a tough time finding the workers they need to, to take care of what we all know is going to be an exploding population of older people. Um, and something like 10,000, 10,000 people retire every day in this country. And forget the Social Security crisis and Medicare crisis, but just find the workers you need. But, but to your point, I mean, the bill, it's important to recognize, at least from the, you know, there's, there's the agricultural title that's, that's directed at the ag industry. There's the so-called high-skilled title that's, that's more the Microsofts and the Intels, but also other companies that use high-skilled workers in the STEM fields. And then there's this new WB, so lesser-skilled. Um, and, and then legalization is probably is going to benefit many employers, but I would, I would say, I would say you can jump in on this, would be probably those industries that are more service-oriented or in the lesser skill. Well, you know, we, we represent janitors. This will be a huge benefit because a lot of people are on that community, and, and uh, many of them are our members, yeah. but also in the hospitality industry, restaurants, hotels, uh, you know, there's a lot of people in those areas, construction. So I think all of these, and I would include agriculture, obviously, in that. In some cases, it's 75% mm -hmm. of people that may be undocumented, nobody knows. We certainly don't know because we never ask, but we just know from knowing the industry. So legalizing them will stabilize all of these industries. I, I think from the perspective, if I were an employer, I would say, I can invest in my workers knowing that they'll be here tomorrow instead of uh, do I get an I-9 audit by DHS and then i got to fire them all and then who I replace them with. And, you know, it just the stability I think will be really important for the workers in their personal lives and for the business in the business lives. Yeah. Uh, you want to talk? No, no, I, it, it's, it's a broad... When you look at sectors of the economy, it's just various parts will benefit in different ways. I think that's um, the way we're summarizing Are there any other questions from the audience? Yes, here's a question from Jeff Shackett, and I recognize the name because he took a class from me in my first semester at Cornell 23 years ago. I hope, Jeff, you're doing fine. The question is, assume the immigration bill passes, what metrics will the unions and employers use to assess its success? What are the positive outcomes each hopes the bill will yield? Well, from labor's perspective, you know, we know that there will approximately 11 million people that will have to go through the process. We are now talking to our allies and everybody else on how we are going to meet that demand. And so I think how many people actually wind up applying and going through the process is going to be critically important. We also have to find out ways of working with them to make sure that cost does not become a disqualifier. So all of those things we're actually working with, but for me, success will be 11 million people who will no longer be afraid, who will be legal uh, residents and eventually citizens of this country. And it, I'd love to get every one of them through the process, and we will have to work really hard to make it happen because these are some people that have lived in the shadows and don't may not have the information they need in order to uh, successfully uh, process uh, go through the process. So we got a lot of work, and but we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. We got to pass it first. Yeah, that's that's a very good question and a fair one. I'm not quite. I mean. Personally, since I'm a lawyer, I'm going to open my own little shop and do legalization <laughs> petitions and, you know, and get rich. Um, but they give a good deal, too. Um, I'm not quite sure. I mean, we, we there's the metrics that the LSA was talking about, how many people of the 11 million will come forward. It's interesting. If two years out, only 2 million have come forward, then there's, there's a problem. Yeah. Maybe it's the application. Maybe it's the bureaucracy. Um, but in my case, uh, that'll be something we'll look at, but also... Uh, I think just the views of my membership, I'm hoping two years from now they're going to say that was a great deal uh, we, we got to the Senate and the House and to the President and that things are working smoothly. Everything's going to be kinks. Uh, but I'll be looking to my membership to give me feedback if I'm still at the chamber, uh, which I anticipate being. Uh, but it's a good question. It's a fair question. And, and other than the legalization petitions, are there other ways to measure successes? I'll, I'll have to give some thought to that. Are there any structures that could be proposed so that you um, 
as labor and business are more part of the process of the implementation and the monitoring. Uh, but is that being is that part of the conversation at all, or does? Uh, you mean like at the regulatory stage when yeah. when after the bills pass we need the regulations? Yes. Yes. I'm sure that'll come up. I oh. hope that uh, when we get to regulations, it's not a food fight in the sense of. Oh no, we agreed on that word, but now that we're drilling down, we have different different disagreements. I hope that uncertainty in these areas that, that we can transcribe. It's compelling if you know regular, it would be compelling and almost unprecedented if we agreed on sort of regulatory comments and, and certain so but I I haven't thought that far ahead. Okay. Well, let me just say that yeah. we've been so busy trying to get it passed that yeah. we haven't really had the conversation, but I do think Getting the information to people is going to be critical. Uh, a lot of them are our members. A lot of them go to church. A lot of them work for employers uh, um, in the chamber and others. We all have a role to play in making sure that that information is made available to them. And I'm hoping once we're celebrating, the next morning we can start having conversations about how do we make sure that uh, we work together to make this program a success. And there is a provision in the bill, and LC, you might be on uh, integration, and I think that that's, um, you know, it's going to cost some money. I, I do think it's it's very important for for all of us, but the government including, but us, we play a role in trying to integrate, um, well, I'll just say it, Latinos, but others in, into, the, into the American mainstream through the expanded ESL language courses. My own visceral reaction when I've done this as long as I have is a lot of opposition to the, at least to the past bills, but you've seen less of it now. But to this, it's not, it's just, I think there's this visceral reaction of when they hear people not speaking English, whether you like it or not, I'll say this, and they go to McDonald's and, you know, you got a 90 year old senior citizen who can't quite understand the person who's taking their money on the other side. There's this visceral reaction to, oh, these people just don't want to become a part of the American fabric. And of course, survey after survey shows one it's not true because who wouldn't want to be and who wouldn't want to learn English. Um, so we got as part of making this bill acceptable even after it's passed. But working well, I think, is 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 helping people integrate into into the American mainstream. And that doesn't mean get rid of values of other countries or anything else. It's just we are a melting pot, and that's been our strength. And, and well, I agree with uh, with Randy in terms of the need to make sure that. Uh, we provide the services that people have to be integrated into society. I'll tell you, my experience as an immigrant is that we first generation, I'm the second generation, we have a big argument with our kids having them to learn Spanish mm -hmm. because they all want to speak nothing but English because society and the English culture is so predominant that after a while, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of hard for them to remember who they are. And I think it's it, in many ways who we are as a melting pot, that all of us bring our own experiences, our cultures and trends that makes us unique. And we should always remember that, that uh, that's uh, what makes America strong, is that we all come from different parts of the world, we contribute, and we build a much different country than any other. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I want to remind people, as well as our panelists, uh, that we only have a few minutes left, and so... Uh, if there are if there aren't any more questions, um, maybe we can start wrapping up our conversation. Uh, perhaps, Lowell, you uh, have something that you would like to add to the conversation, and maybe you also give the opportunity to both Randy and Eliseo to uh, uh, provide his uh, closing remarks. Okay, I have one. We have uh, several more questions that have come in, and I apologize we're not going to have time to address them all. I'll just mention one of them and then uh, look forward to some closing remarks from our speakers, and then I'll just give a quick wrap up. Here's the question um, How would you respond to criticisms from Republican senators like Jeff Sessions, who contended recently that the benefit of Im immigration reform will go to business owners and make it harder for out of work Americans to find jobs? I would just say that um, the fact is that if we legalize these people, it will help all workers. It will lift all boats because we will no longer have underground economies. We will no longer have a situation where people don't uh, have the opportunity to be able to uh, be paid fairly and according to the law. And I think that's a big up to every worker in this country. 
Well, I respond in, in one, of course, is I don't think the unions would be, uh, well, if that was true, the unions wouldn't be sitting here, but, uh, but I wouldn't be either. Uh, so, but, but more of that, I guess, more substantively, I just want to emphasize uh, with regard to certain temporary worker programs, uh, one, as compared to the overall national economy, they're extremely limited in terms of numbers. Uh, but more importantly, all of these have, have, have uh, protections in there so that employers don't use them until they, they, they try to recruit U.S. workers to the jobs before that. And if employers don't have, have the workers they need to create the product they produce, that lowers the GDP, and that's bad for everyone. So uh, when people think about shutting off the economy and having no immigrants come into the country, that will drive up wages. That's, that's just a foolish view of the, of the economy and the way things work. That leads to a shrinking GDP and less wealth for the entire country, not, not higher wages. Uh, with regard to legalization, I think that um, there is sometimes a problem with, with um, undermining U.S. workers because th these workers are afraid of using their, their protections under labor laws, and so they can be exploited by some employers. Um, and that has a residual effect of, I think, pushing some U.S. workers out of lower-skilled jobs. And when we legalize them, that anti-competitive uh, effect won't be there. Uh, overall, the economists have, uh, have looked at this carefully, and increased immigration uh, does not have a depressive effect on, on wages, and it leads to increased GDP for the entire country. Thank you. Uh, Lowell? Um, I guess we're going to pull the plug now. It's been a great, uh, a great conversation. There have been a few network problems. There's been a little bit of choppiness, and we apologize for that. Also, for the questions that we were not able to get to. Um, but we have your questions, and we will send them on to our speakers, and maybe they or some of their representatives can answer your questions when they have time. I know they're very busy. Uh, right now. If you'd like to watch this webcast again or send it to a friend, the same link that you use to get onto the webcast, it will now be the archive for this webcast so that you can watch it again and you can forward it on to all your friends and put it on your Facebook page and put it on your listservs and get the word out uh, about this important issue. Finally, on behalf of the Worker Institute of Cornell, I would like to thank Randy and Eliseo and Maria uh, for participating in this discussion and also to our viewers for tuning in, for asking questions. And please remember that political engagement is the essence of a democracy. I always tell my students, if you don't like the news, go out and make some of your own. So if you like this bill, get out there and support it. Uh, if you have questions about it, ask your questions. Uh, uh, you know, stand up for what you believe, and let's see what we can do. Thank you all. <laughs>